Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our first annual Education Impact Day. Today is Saturday, November 12th, 2016, and we have as our first guest, Heidi silver Paquilla. Did I say that correctly, Heidi? Yes, I did. <laughs> I hope. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Heidi is with the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, otherwise known as OCTE. Well, we, we really just want to welcome you, and we're so excited to have you uh, joining us this morning, and we can't wait to hear about your impact. <laughs> I, I think without further ado, I might just okay. hand it over to you, if that's okay. Okay, that sounds great. Well, good morning, everybody, uh, and uh, hello to folks who are joining and uh, viewing later. Uh, thanks for viewing. Uh, my name's Heidi, and I work at the Department of Education. Uh, it's my job at the department and really my passion to open up uh, access and opportunities for youth and adults, especially low-income families uh, who are re-engaging with education. Uh, I've been doing this for many years, and I'm happy to be doing it at the department for the last uh, five and a half years. I think about impact every day, uh, and I talk about impact with my team members. Uh, and our contractors and our grantees and our teachers and everyone we talk with because um, I want to think uh, and keep impact in the front of our minds uh, because we're really working for individuals who are at the margins of our society and need a way to get back in. Um, so it really drives us to keep telling stories about how education matters and how education changes lives and improves families well-being. So some of the things that I'm thinking about today are telling stories and sharing data. Um, and most of us are pretty good at telling stories. And I have a student who, and I knew a student who, and those uh, inspirational stories that we bring students back to our events and they tell us, I made it, right? I came through, I stuck with it, I came to the other side, and here is how it has impacted me. But I think it's also important to share data um, about the impact of education on adults and their families to create awareness and uh, gain interest and involvement from other partners. Uh, those of us who are already inside, uh, our hearts are already here. We need to be reaching out and really tugging at the intellect and hearts of others who are not in this work with us yet. And data can be a very powerful um, uh, mechanism to do that and really help you reach new audiences. Uh, many people don't know about the low-skilled problem in our country, don't know how many people don't have education. You really have to share that data. We've been talking um, around the country uh, for the last couple of years about the survey of adult skills from the OECD, uh, sometimes called PIAC, which is really the full uh, acronym for the Program of International Assessment of Adult Competencies. Uh, I call it the Survey of Adult Skills, it's more, uh, <laughs> more hearable. Uh, and this survey assessed the literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving skills of adults. The U.S. performance compared to the other industrialized countries in the US OECD was very low. Uh, it was really shocking. Uh, and that has been a data story we've been sharing. Uh, it's a hard story to hear. People are surprised, they're uh, upset, they're disbelieving that uh, there are so many low income and low skilled individuals in our country. Uh, and yet there it is staring us in the face. Uh, but it also revealed that two thirds of the low skilled youth and adults are working. They're employed. They may be employed in more than one job. They may not have a good job. And in fact, they were uh, still fairly uh, low wage uh, workers, but they're employed. So we know where they are. They're in their job and they're on their way to their job or on their way to their next job. And sharing this data story did capture a new audience for us. Um, we started working with big employers those big employers who employ a lot of low-skilled workers. And sharing this data really helped them understand their workers in a different way and help them 
galvanize really to start offering more education and training opportunities to those workers through the workplace uh, where they already are. They just don't have time to go to class. Um, and upskillamerica.org uh, is a, an initiative run by the Aspen Institute. And it's really a data outgrowth of this story. Um, and it's, uh, it's been very interesting to work with these companies and to see what could be done outside of the usual education you know, mechanisms uh, and avenues. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let folks know mm -hmm. I did put on uh, in the chat, check, uh, chat box the, um, mm -hmm. the PX survey and then all, also Upskill um, America. And we, we, last week we had several folks from um, Designers for Learning and, and also some friends from um, American Institutes of Re for Research. Um, we gave a presentation at um, Open Ed and as you said, it, it, people really don't believe the data. And the way we laid it out, we had those that were significant, significantly above the U.S., those that were um, comparable to the U.S. and those below. Mm -hmm. And um, the most scary, I think, and the one that people mm -hmm. don't believe is the problem solving with tech technology, given that we're the country that mm -hmm. has Apple and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. So could, could, you, could you speak to that a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of um, you know, parsing that data and, and what that means, um, especially for jobs that may be available um, to unskilled or, or to mm -hmm. those who are unemployed? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the uh, digital problem solving was very surprising um, to most of us. And uh, it was disheartening that it was a low performance across the age span. So even the 16 to 20 year olds uh, who are just, you know, look at me today, just dripping uh, with technology uh, all the time, uh, never separated from their phones, right? They also scored very low. But let me tell you a little bit about the measure and what they were measuring. Um, they weren't checking to see if you could find a song mm -hmm. or uh, buy something online. Uh, this was a test of sort of workplace readiness skills. Could you use Excel and find information and organize information and present it back? Could you use um, a mock application like um, uh, Microsoft Outlook and schedule a meeting? Now, we all know this is very challenging <laughs> to find time on many people's calendars to schedule a meeting. Can you use these uh, not entertainment and not leisure time apps, but workplace kind of apps? Are you work ready? Are you job ready? Uh, and unfortunately, they are not. They are not using these common workplace tools in the kind of linear way that we do at work. Um, and uh, I said in many uh, presentations, none of us can retire <laughs> because <laughs> the best performers were the 45 plus. Uh, because we, this is the way we think and the way we've set up the workplace, right? And I will be a, a great cheerleader when the millennials come in and change the way we're working and move us to Google Docs and move us uh, to more flexible applications. But uh, that's not happening right now. And they need jobs right now. And uh, there have been other surveys of what of the skills that employers are looking for. And uh, use of Excel was one that was really high. Uh, they want people to be able to come in and organize information. Uh, use of Excel was a, a big marker. Uh, writing skills, uh, online writing skills was a big marker. This is not chat. And it's not texting, it's writing, memos, uh, nonfiction, work-based writing. Uh, so I think it was a wake-up call that we have more career readiness work to do with our young people uh, coming into jobs. So. Yeah, we, um, as, as you know, and, and probably a lot of folks that are listening know, um, one of our missions at Designers for Learning is to create open educational resources for adult learners. And we have a great panel of subject matter experts in adult education helping us 
um, and one of the first things you do, obviously, when you're designing instruction is to determine what your objectives are and what it is mm -hmm. you're going to be teaching. And so this whole idea of contextualized learning where you're um, building the, embedding the instruction into a context that would um, help the learner practice those skills that they would use. And so what I think is a struggle for a lot of, um, of us who are coming to this, when we think about preparing someone, for example, for the GED, we think, oh, we need to make sure they know how to work with fractions and they need to know. Um, but this yeah. whole idea of, um, I think it's really um, interesting coming into adult basic education and adult education from um, other um, uh, educational segments is this um, emphasis on contextualized learning. And I think it's great. I think mm -hmm. it's something that we could do in all the way through K-12, through yes. whatever, but for whatever reason, it really is, you know, taken hold from, uh, from adult education, which I think is great. And so you had mentioned um, as far as work-based skills, where I put a link in the chat that you had shared yesterday yes. on the employability skills. Um, can you give us some insight on where um, we can, as, as we're in, uh, instructional designers and educators, the types of skills that we should be including in our instruction as well as those academic skills like basic reading? Sure, and sure. Yeah, and thanks for putting the um, employability skills framework link in the chat box. Um, this is a tool that has been built over several years at the department um, in cooperation with uh, our contractors. And uh, it really started out by looking across the many, many uh, frameworks that are filling this space. 21st century skills, the secretary scan skills, you remember those from way back. Uh, uh, all of the problem solving uh, lists and frameworks and saying, okay, so what's in common? We've got all of these lists going, what's in common? Uh, and the employability skills framework has uh, really pulled that together, tried to identify the common categories of skills and the kind of principles underneath them and uh, has laid it out in a very nice interactive uh, framework. They've gone on to create crosswalks with assessments uh, and with the college and career readiness skills uh, that are part of the Common Core and are also part of the college and career readiness skills for adult education. Um, and that way you can kind of crosswalk, you know, as I'm teaching uh, deep reading, um, close reading, as I'm teaching critical thinking skills and critical literacy skills, which uh, Janet put in the, the chat, uh, how am I also meeting career readiness skills, right? These things go hand in hand. Our academics should not be separated from a contextualized use of them and applied use. Um, that's part of the problem, right? Uh, we get out of our classes and we say, okay, I got an A, but what do I do again? How do I use this information? Uh, we have to contextualize our, uh, our teaching and our learning. Um, and the employability skills framework is a great place to look for ideas on how to embed career readiness skills into uh, academic teaching. And I wanna say also that uh, the new law for adult education, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, uh, has given us a new hook for employability skills. Uh, they called it workplace uh, skills, but employability skills is embedded in that, uh, and that's the 21st century skills, critical literacy, digital literacy, um, workplace readiness, all of these skills, it, we're all pushing toward the same thing. They may have different names, but we have to be teaching our students uh, and letting them teach us <laughs> about their workplaces, right? And saying, hey, that's not how my workplace works. You know, They want me to be able to do X, Y, and Z. A lot of us have been educators a long time and our adult students are out there in the workplace. So let them teach us um, the kinds of skills they need to know to do their own job better and to advance. Right. Um, and not I, I, at the risk of switching gears, I do want to make sure you can get all the plugs in for all the wonderful um, initiatives <laughs> that are there. And number one, I think for me anyway, um, with it from a, a federal government looking at um, the resources that are shared is the Links Network. Yeah. Would you mind uh, telling us about that, the, how, where yeah. it came from? And, and it's, it's for, as I said, we, we certainly rely on it for the work we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to hear from your perspective, the development and what the, um, the objectives are. 
Yeah, well, Lynx is, uh, goes way, way back. Uh, it has been around for over 12 years uh, in one form or another. It actually got started under the National Institute for Literacy, NIFL. Uh, and when NIFL was closed in 2010, um, Octe, then Ove, absorbed Lynx and promised the field that we would keep it and uh, grow it. And we've been able to do that. It's really one of the ways that we uh, try and help programs and teachers be the best they can be so that students are getting the uh, educational gains that they need. Uh, it's a central hub uh, where we communicate to teachers and programs, the field at large. It's a source of curated resources. Um, it's got a learning management system with over two dozen courses that teachers can take uh, at their own pace and without cost. Uh, just log in, it's free registration, uh, and on a wide variety of topics. And there's also a very lively community of practice with over 10,000 practitioners signed in on 16 uh, user uh, community groups of different topics. Uh, so at any given time, there may be a very nice conversation going on that would appeal uh, to our listeners. And uh, actually, you do not have to register to read on the community. You can just look, uh, poke around, be a lurker. That's fine. We encourage that. Uh, but we also encourage you to sign in so that you can comment and you can like uh, different discussions and you can make your voice heard, ask questions, et cetera. Get some help from your peers and help from experts that come on um, as guest discussants from time to time. We've had a very lively discussion going on for the last few weeks around the uh, intersection of adult basic ed and developmental ed. Mm -hmm. So how, how can we help students not use all their Pell money on developmental ed? Uh, how can we help colleges adjust their programming? How do we serve all these students? Uh, so that's been a, a very lively uh, conversation uh, at links.ed.gov. And I see you put it in there, so thank you. And I just want to uh, echo what Susan's saying, as I, we mentioned at the start of this before, I think we turned the recording on, Susan Jones is with us, she's uh, working with us in our, in our project, and, um, and I think she's making a, her statement is that, um, I'm so, she's so glad that Lynx was done, she feels like she's on a little island at her mm -hmm. institution, and we hear that over and over from adult mm -hmm. educators, sometimes um, in, in, um, Amanda Duffy uses this example, she used to teach in the basement of a library, I believe, <laughs> And she would work part time. Um, I think a lot of the times, maybe she was even a volunteer. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. She was even always teaching as a paid um, paid instructor. Mm -hmm. We hear that over and over and over that um, Lynx isn't a place. Uh, it is a place where everyone can go and share stories and share mm -hmm. resources mm -hmm. and share experiences, um, because there isn't that uh, idea where everyone's when going to school from eight to four. And you'll you'll not have to an adult ed. Yeah, <laughs> I think that is a really Susan. I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that, um, and actually, that might be kind of an interesting, I think people really aren't aware, and I'm not throwing you on the spot because this isn't something we talked about <laughs> in right. advance, but can you talk a little bit about ed adult educators? Uh, because it is, to me, it has been very fascinating to, to peek inside their world and, and unfortunately the lack of resources that they uh, sometimes are working yeah. So um, our office, uh, the Office of Career Technical and Adult Ed, uh, administers the WIOA funding, and we get the uh, AFLA funding, which is Adult Ed and Family Literacy. Our money then is um, formula funded out to the states, and then states compete down to the local level for the local programs that are teaching adult ed. Our money is actually quite small, uh, $600 million divided by 57, uh, but it's formula, that not everybody gets the same. And uh, then states actually make up the bulk of the funding in adult ed in many cases, but in not, not in every state is it well supplemented. So there's a huge disparity between some states uh, in what they're able to offer uh, for adult ed programming. And consequently, we have a wide variety of settings and uh, systems. Uh, many of our adult ed programs are located in the um, education department in their states. Others are in the community college system or board of regions, and others are in sort of the workforce development or department of labor. Uh, 
classes are taught all over the place and uh, teachers are largely part-time. Uh, we have like an 80% part-time teacher uh, average, which means we don't have a lot of teachers who can really dedicate their lives uh, to adult education and uh, professional development around adult education. So it's a challenge, uh, but the programs are trying to meet students where they are in the community. And if the basement of the library is in the heart of the community where the students are living, then that's the very best place that it could be. Uh, but it also means that we don't always have all of the equipment uh, and materials that one would hope uh, would be in an adult ed classroom. Uh, when you're in the basement of a library, you're sharing that space with other groups, clearly, uh, and would have to put things away at the end of each class. So that creates a challenge. And uh, Jennifer, you can ask me a question about OER in response to that <laughs> I was challenge. just going to say, you just gave me the softball <laughs> right there. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying yeah. that there's a need for resources, and in particular for those who don't have funds for funds. <laughs> Um, so it would seem to me uh, open educational resources <laughs> would fill that need. <laughs> yeah, so we have really been pushing open ed resources in the last few years as a way to meet this need. Uh, we have part-time teachers and we have students who are attending for not many hours a week actually, right? They are working, as I said earlier, they're working, they can't uh, devote all of their time to class. And we saw in open ed resources, the opportunity to bring really highly designed, high quality instructional materials into the classroom in a low cost way. Uh, and in a way that would be engaging to students and that they could look at, watch, do, interact with, build on outside of classroom, but also uh, in a way that teachers could be learning from highly designed instruction as well. Uh, our teachers don't have a lot of time for professional development. Uh, and this has really brought some nice um, resources into the classroom uh, where then the teachers and the students are learning together, right? And it's kind of changing the model of teaching. We have a lot more classrooms that would be called a flipped model. Uh, we have a lot more teaching that would be called a facilitated model rather than a didactic model. So uh, the introduction of OER has really helped us on several fronts, on instruction, on supplemental learning, getting students to interact longer and more deeply with the material, uh, getting teachers some professional development even while they're teaching, um, and uh, it has also given us an opportunity to help some teachers grow uh, around a model of professional development we've been running um, that we're calling teacher user groups. Uh, so I'm going to pause, Jennifer, in case you want to ask me something else about OER before I launch into teaching. Yeah. Well, I think I just wanted to um, loop back the idea of OER um, to the idea of um, we, three, three different things. Uh, the OER mm -hmm. piece, the piece that the, um, the, the un unfortunate uh, skill gap in technology, skill use, mm -hmm. and then the unfortunate gap in resources available at the settings in a lot of settings. And we, this is something that we run into a lot where mm -hmm. um, our designers within our, um, our service MOOC would like to create online learning and create mm -hmm. resources that would be used as e-learning or something you'd use it on, on a computer. And certainly, as you said, the, the contexts are very diverse. Um, some report back that they have wonderful computer labs and great yes. technology. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, sometimes that feels like that's the minor minority of our settings. Mm -hmm. And so that is a rub for the designers. Mm -hmm. They're trying to uh, fill, fill the gap in terms of having instructional materials to help people develop their technology skills, yet you're developing materials that, they, that can't be accessed <laughs> with the, uh, the latest and greatest internet, uh, internet yeah. access and things. Yeah. So any thoughts yeah. on that? I, 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 it's kind of not maybe yeah. an unanswerable uh, problem right now, but... Um, well, uh, it's very diverse. I mean, that is the challenge. And I think um, I would encourage people to design to the most open standards they can. Uh, something that can be seen on the widest variety of platforms, something that can be accessed uh, in the most browsers possible, really 
to be the most inclusive. Um, and sometimes that means not having the flashiest feature of uh, functionality, but our students really need to learn the material, uh, the flashiest functionality can sometimes get in the way. And, and it's not only our classes that have intermittent tests or machines, it's our students as well. Many of them are using uh, the computers at the libraries uh, in their communities, or they're sharing a laptop with their kids, uh, or they go over to a friend's house and say, hey, can I log on? Um, it's, it's not consistent. Uh, people do not have nice new MacBooks at home, you know, in this population. They just don't. Uh, and so what can we put online that is high quality learning, if even if it's not the flashiest um, and the newest technologies? Yeah, that's... Um, and I'm also, um, Susan has just reminded us, um, there was a question in the chat um, regarding whether the um, links can be used. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the question or the yeah. context, so maybe you yes, can. I, yeah. So uh, one of the things that I am trying to do uh, is to help states and um, programs through our latest contract, which is called the Lynx PD Center, to use our materials at the state level. And I talk about this as localizing links. Okay, links is this national platform and you can log in and talk to peers around the country. You can take courses and print out your certificate and then at the end of the year, turn it into your uh, state and hope that they recognize these hours uh, for your continuing education credit. But what I'd really like to see and what we're working toward is that states that have the requirements and have some priorities that they're trying to get teachers to rally around, that states would localize those resources and make them part of their state requirements. That they would uh, ask teachers to take a particular course and then have some face-to-face uh, -face or hybrid wraparound on that online course uh, or that they would download the training and offer it and change it up and customize it to their own priorities and needs and uh, open little micro groups that are just for their teachers, all of these ways to really customize and localize the resources that are available and available through federal funding. So they really should be there for you. And uh, we're working on that. Yeah. That's what, uh, what we're trying to do. And the question is if, the courses could actually be imported into a state LMS where teachers are already working. And this is a question we've heard and we have a pilot going right now. Uh, five states are trying this um, and they started it under the previous uh, PD centers, our PDC centers, and uh, the new PD center will be taking up this charge or trying to wrap up the pilot and figure out what we need to do to make this easier so that our Links resources are open for states to adopt, adapt, change, build, improve, uh, all of that. So yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, I hope you will continue to ask it and uh, look for when we're ready to open those courses up. And um, just to tie in the, um, the prior uh, con conversation we had regarding technology, um, there have been a couple of comments in the text chat regarding the use mm -hmm. of cell phones. Yes. And maybe that would be a bridge. As you said, they seem to be able to work their cell phones fairly well. <laughs> yeah. It's a matter of making that bridge. So maybe yeah. if you have uh, them use the Google features as on their cell phones, uh -huh. you can look up some information and try to bridge that gap back to... Yeah back to what we're working on. Well, we're coming up to the half hour, and uh, that's, uh, I just wanted to make sure um, you had the opportunity to, to share any uh, initiatives that you are uh, working on, and if um, give you the opportunity to make a plea to this audience. <laughs> the, the whole purpose of our day today is what impact will you make? Yeah. And I certainly am on my soapbox at every opportunity saying that if you want to make an impact, adult education is wide open. Um, so that's my little soapbox. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to hear, hear your perspective on that as well, where people could make an impact in adult ed. Yeah, it, adult education is a wonderful place um, to make an impact because it's so immediate 
and it's so wide ranging. The cha uh, changes that get made in an adult's life really impact the whole family and spread out to the community. You can see whole communities getting organized, um, starting to come together in ways where they were previously isolated. Um, so working in adult education is fantastic. Volunteering as a literacy tutor gets you one student uh, to really understand that change that happens. And I think about uh, the impact of education for adults as being both, both formal and informal, uh, as slow and fast and broad and deep. There, it's, it's interesting how it works. Uh, some things happen right away and people open up and they say, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could do that. Look, I can do that now. And that's fast. And then other changes you see over, the, over time, over years. And you see that when a mom comes and she gets her uh, high school diploma, her kids are motivated to stay in school and get their high school diploma. You see lots of uh, moms and kids going across that stage together uh, across the country, and that's just so wonderful. Um, and, but change takes time in the workplace and in advancement. And uh, some research that we funded uh, recently uh, by Dr. Steve Reeder out of the Longitudinal Study of Adult Learners, uh, that 10-year study that looked at adult ed students, uh, the change that happens economically and academically is really quite slow. It doesn't always happen in the time frames that we have students with us in class, right? The average time in class, um, time in class isn't the right word, the average length of persistence in one go at adult education is about 100 hours. And that's not very much, mm -hmm. um, but people do stop out and then they come back. And when, you know, when they get time in their lives, they come back uh, and it takes over years uh, to accrue that kind of educational gains that will really level them up to the next uh, uh, level of ability in their jobs and uh, in their academics. So it's slow, uh, but it's very worthwhile. It's transformative. Uh, and it transforms the teachers as well as the students, the teachers and tutors. Uh, we absolutely need volunteers in adult education as much as we need dedicated teachers. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, the PX study showed us there is a lot of work to do and uh, is so rewarding. So I encourage folks to check it out, try it. Uh, see what they can do, go to a graduation ceremony, go to a, an immigrant, uh, a naturalization ceremony, and see if that resonates and uh, if this is a place that could use your talents. And what you mentioned a couple of things with the families working, um, being, you know, the children being proud of their parents and seeing that as a, a role mm -hmm. model. And one uh, thing that's been very interesting for me to follow is the idea of family liter literacy. So within the, um, uh, if the mm -hmm. um, mom or the dad is working on improving their skills, um, as far as developing lessons for them, try to figure out a way to loop it in where they're working with their kids at the yeah. same time. And yeah. it kind of bridges that gap between K-12 and yeah. uh, and a lot of um, problem-based learning you can set up that way, right? Go talk to your kids about blah, 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 and have them help you and come to some understanding and really set it up to be intergenerational uh, and uh, kind of push that issue. Uh, the two-gen approach, three-gen approach right. is fantastic, uh, really gets people talking with each other as learners. Learner, learning doesn't happen only in classrooms, right? Yeah. It's, it's a lifelong, life-wide experience, and uh, two-gen approaches are just so wonderful to bring education right to the kitchen table. Yeah. And uh, well, just a follow-up question mm -hmm. to uh, when you were mentioning how to bridge from the federal to the state. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Deb was asking if there is a particular contact that she might be able to reach out to. or uh, You can reach out to me. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, you can put my, my email at, uh, it's heidi.silver hyphen paquilla at ed.gov and uh, just send it to me. Excellent. And we'll get, get you connected. And um, I don't know if you have time to stick around at all for any questions and, and yes, feel free I do. if you need to, but um, does anyone have any particular questions that they like to ask that we haven't asked already? 
Did you get a chance, Heidi, to go through um, the most important things that you wanted to make sure that we were? Yes, I think we're on? we are good there. Um, I'll, I'll also, you, uh, Heidi gave me a wonderful list of resources, and when we conclude this and record it and post it on YouTube, we'll send it out with all of the show notes that would include all the links that she sent, as well as her email. Uh, all right. Well, I think we're good. I'm not seeing yeah, any. A good group, very early. <laughs> very early, yes. And thank you so it's much. Okay for the East Coast, but I, I'm sorry for all of you <laughs> who are not on East Coast time. Tune in later this afternoon. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.